In 2012, I happened that year to be the current year chairman of MFGC GLCI, a Missouri Sport and Grassland Council. And Craig and others were putting this thing together, and they wanted Missouri Forest and Grassland Council involved, so they asked me if I would, you know, kind of be part of this. Then they found out that my whole farm was converted to novel endophyte, and then I ended up here. <laughs> but this is my story, and I'm sticking to it, and I hope you enjoy it. My background. North of Minneapolis, about one hour, is where I hit the ground. Mom and Dad had about 24 Holstein cows. Mom had a couple hundred layers. Dad had a couple dozen sows. Pretty typical operation. Leaving that farm, went off for a few years, got a university education in animal science and dairy science, and uh, from there into a 33-year career in agribusiness. Long held dream was to have a little cow-calf operation. And I say little, 127 acres of grass, 75, 80 cows. Number of you here are a lot bigger than I am. We moved 700 miles south, a whole new world. My learning curve was about straight up. And then I came to learn that there was a poison or a toxin in all this beautiful grass in this country waving in the wind. That would blow the feet off a cattle and the ears off a baby calf in this Kentucky 31. 1948, farmers were first reporting that Kentucky 31 was adversely affecting their livestock performance. 1976 or 1977, scientists first discovered that there was an endophyte creating a poison in the tall fescue that was affecting the animal's performance adversely. And we've been with it this long. How can this be? It don't have to be. Being one to resolve to accomplish certain things, I resolved to manage it. There's two classes of cattle producers, folks. There's folks that just turn them out and see what happens. And then there's folks that manage. I resolved to manage. So I make some changes. And what were they? Well, I did the best thing I ever did agriculturally in my life. And that is I went to a grazing school and went home and began to intensively manage my grazing. Here's the place. We own these two 40s on the south. We own this 40. And about six years ago, I came to rent this 40 up here. And in 2011, the west half of it was sold off, and I lost it. And I still do rent this. So all together today, i got 127 acres of grass. Four of it is right here. That's still toxic because they're too small to get in with the drill, little one-acre traps. But the rest of it is all novel. I grazed the whole thing in rotation. When I go around each 40, here's a water fountain in the middle. I run a poly wire there, poly wire there. The two of them are 80, 90 feet apart out here, 16 feet apart on two posts here. So my cattle, any given day, are between two poly wires on a rolling post. When I go out at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, or both if I feel like it, and I roll the front wire forward, Cattle go to new grass, and I roll the back wire up. It takes me about 10 minutes. And they're like dairy cows. The cows stay between two lines, the calves go out and creep graze, and it works. But when I get done with this 40, I go down the lane, out to the T, go down to this 40, and I rock around it. When that 40 is cleaned off, I go up this 40 and I rock around it. Now, while I'm busy rocking, plants are busy growing, and all of a sudden I start seeing boot stage grass. Now I could let it head out, but I don't. I come out with my nine foot, two inch steel cow, and I cut everything that's getting ahead of the, getting ahead of the cows. 
and I take the cows back to where it's been grazed off already, and it's regrown, and I do the garish nose to eye. So basically I, you know, when it's up to the eye, hit it, start grazing. If you can't get on there with cows, get on there with steel. Fall cab only, so I need about 80, 90 days worth of hay for winter. And that excess growth in the spring gives me that, that hay that I need. Now, even after managed the grazing, I recognized or still felt that toxic fescue was costing me gains I could have had. I'm a numbers guy, I do the math, I know what has a gain on cool season grass if it's not poisonous, and I was at about three-fourths of that. I had the shaggy cattle like Craig showed you in some of his pictures. I learned real quickly at JRS that the buyers will discount those cattle. I was committed to an AI program, but the results were disappointing. I know too you can select, and today there's a lot of emphasis being put, in, put on selecting for genetics for tolerance to fescue. And admittedly, there are cattle more tolerant than others. Even though those cattle you select might be more resistant, they're not immune. And, you know, would you take your kid, instead of giving them two teaspoons of arsenic a day, give them just about three quarter of one teaspoon? I mean, why feed poison at all? So, what am I going to do? Well, remember now, 1994-95, and I'm facing this choice. There's no novel endophyte fescue. That was not an option. There was endophyte free. And thankfully, that was already proved or tried and disproven as a viable alternative. It was dying. And I'm really glad the timing was what it was, because I was one of those people who probably would have jumped on and to fight free and put in 10, 20 acres of it and watch it fail. But I'm either going to go to that or I'm going to try and manage the toxic fescue. And I chose the latter. So what did I do? I drilled in a bunch of clover, made sure I kept the grass vegetative, made sure I had a mineral with oreomycin in it, went to fall calving. Cut my nitrogen applications back to 35 pounds, max, at any one application. And like I say, didn't even try that one, because I didn't want to dilute the gains I was going to get in carcass and growth from my AI program. How'd that all work for me? Well, Laspedisa, beautiful feed, low yielding in terms of dry matter. I mean, it doesn't hold candle to pounds per acre you can get with a good fescue stand. Red clover and ladino, <coughs> due to the variability especially that was existing in my farm at that time, uh, you know, caught good there, caught good there, but right here, not so much. Uh, calf gains did get a little better, probably closer to five than to ten. Abortions went down some. Foot problems, I still had them. And uh, yeah, I was spending more for mineral. In the year 2000, I was down the road about six miles managing a little farm supply store. And a salesman came by and uh, told me about a fescue where they'd taken out the endophyte and put in an endophyte that made the plant hardy and persistent but did not create the toxin. So I studied, researched it, checked it out, found the data, three quarter of a pound a day on stockers. I'm thinking, but I don't have stockers. Then I started applying my, my logic. My cow, my milking machine, my milk making machine, who loses her right rear foot first, because that's the extreme part of her body from her heart. Well, her udder isn't much closer. Milk is made out of the blood that flows to the udder. Herbivalene 
constricts arteries, reduces blood flow to the udder. What's that going to do to milk? Most dairymen will tell you they got a herd of cows running, say, a 60 pound tank average, and they t take them off of whatever forage you're on and put them on toxic fescue, they'll drop to about 42 pounds in a week. About a 30% drop in milk. Well, it's doing the same thing to my beef cow. The other thing is, my logic said, after a few months, that little calf I got ain't so little anymore. He's a miniature soccer calf. Mama's taught him how to eat grass. He learned that just by watching her. And he's getting up for he's eating quite a bit of it. I can see that and how far I have to move that front wire each day. Well, I'm probably not losing from the toxin directly to the calf three quarter of a pound, but I'm probably losing somewhere between a third and a half a pound on him every day. So, in 2001, convinced that it was probably a good piece of technology to apply, I stuck my toe in the water, went out to 11 acres on the home 40, straight south of the house, and I had to look at it, turn brown, after being out there with my little 30-foot boom sprayer and spraying two quarts of glyphosate on it. That, that was probably the biggest corner I had to personally make, was to go out and kill a perfectly good stand of fescue. And truth be known, having been there for 50 years, it wasn't really so perfectly good anymore. But it was all I had. In 2002, I did another 20, and it was successful. I never looked back. By 2009, I had my 340s all converted to novel endophyte. Well, things are going along pretty good, but I still get to have this at that time in 2010. I still had the whole 32 acres of rented ground, that northeast quarter of my quarter. Cow herd and calf herd, everybody calves in September, October, and in November we run the cows in, put in the cedars to synchronize. 16 November 2010. They had that day cleaned off the last of the grass novel on my home farm, on my 340s, and all I had left was the 32 acres of rented ground. We put the cedars in. Turned it back out. They had been on my novel for 102 days. It had been 102 days since they had previously been on that 32 acres of toxic ground. The moral is they had become, the story, they had become naive to the toxin from being free of it for so long. And there's a two-year-old heifer, two and a quarter-year-old heifer. She had a beautiful calf on her and one in her, I presume. And uh, I had to shoot her late January. And another one just like her a week after that. Put on the loader before bringing her up to the yard for the dead truck. She looked like that. Right rear foot. Grotesque is, I think, an appropriate word. We don't need to be doing this to our cattle. Like I said earlier in 11, Half of that 32 was sold, and I lost the opportunity to rent it, and I still had the 16 of hot fescue. Talk about a burr under your saddle <coughs> when you're old farmers. Novel, you got the 16 acre, you need to utilize it, and it's hot. For that two year period following 2010, I made sure my cows were never on novel more than 30 days without having a taste of toxin. Just, I don't know if 30 days was right, but it worked for me. I know that 132 days, or 102 days was wrong. The point I want to make, and I think the reason that they've asked me to be here, I keep records. And I got records that prove to me, you don't have to decide for yourself, but they prove to me that when the neighbor said I could go ahead and kill his toxic fescue on that 16 acres, 
and I went ahead and spent $3,200 to do it, I'll have it back in under two years. I based that statement on my records. My cow records, cattle records, are on Microsoft Access, which is a database program. It's such a program. From it, you can design records, anything you want to bring out. But if it happened, I've written it down. People feed it in. Measure it, manage it, and monetize it, right? So, we're going to measure it. Of my 127 acres of grass, backgrounding my calves for two months after they're weaned consumes about six acres. Now, they go over more than that, but it's only for 60 days. But if they were there theoretically for a year, it would take six of my 127 acres. The heifers I raise, 10, 15 a year, seven acres. So there's really 114 acres left available to cows. Divided by my cows is just a hair over one and a half acres per cow. Now, I'm going to show you payback per cow. Because in my head, I approach it this way because it's the cow that's going to pay me back for that 150, 200 bucks per acre. And I'm using 200 per acre as a cost here, okay? Anyway, at one and a half acres per cow, that 200 per acre becomes $304 per cow. So if I go to, I don't buy cows, I haven't bought an animal in 20 years, but if I were to go buy a cow, and she's 2,000, 1,500 today, as soon as she come out, I gotta say, well, for me, she's an $1,800 cow, because I got $300 per acre conversion in her, okay? Here's the, one of the reports I was talking about. The fire column is the birth year. Here is the number of cows serviced that year. If you notice, I got up as high as 91 cows. That's when I had that whole 32 acres of rented ground. Didn't last long. Percent conception, percent wean, and adjusted 205 weight. Now we're going to talk about these numbers in a second. But I want to clear up something on weaning percentage. Anybody want to give me the what weaning percentage is? What's the definition of it? How do you how do you derive that percentage figure? Anybody? Based off mother's size, is that? I'm sorry. Based off mother's size, mother's weight. Right. You take a piece of paper and you draw a line right across the middle of it. Down here is your denominator, right? You write down the number of cows that were exposed to a breeding experience. AI or natural, or both. Clean up. Number of cows exposed. Up here, 16 months later, you write down the number of calves weaned. A lot of folks say, well, my weaning percentage is about 98%. Yeah, because the herd kind of got thinned down. But when you put 16 months between finding the denominator and the numerator, there's the three open cows you sold, and the, there's the two that had bad feet, and there's the one that just broke out underneath that old hackberry tree, and you have no idea why. They all come off. As the denominator gets smaller, the percentage goes up. There's my numbers. Five years before I started messing with it, my weaning percentage averaged 80.2%. My weaning weight, 205 adjusted, averaged 527. My last five years, 91.2, 587. Now, I made note here. There were four years I fed creep feed. Those two and those two. My weaning weights went up to almost 600, or one year it even was. Now, my deduction at the time was I was just kind of trading money with the feed store. There are times it would pay to feed, creep. For me, it's another chore. That's something I've been trying to eliminate, especially in the last couple of years. So I don't creep feed anymore. It, we, I, I don't want a free choice. I would have to bump feed because I believe in control. And that would mean a high fence the calves could go under, and it would mean putting feed out every day. And, I'm not going to bother. But anyway, 
before and after, okay? Now that's what we're going to base our analysis on. Weeding weight, improved by 60 pounds. And I'm using 85 cents worth of each additional pound gained. Times 91% wean, 46 bucks. Increased return per cow from the program. Here's the big gainer. Weaning percentage, from 80.2 to 91.2, an 11 percent increase. On my herd, that was 8.2 more calves weaned and sold at 1050 apiece, or divided by 75 cows, $115 per cow. Coming back home per year. Backgrounding, 60 days, gaining an extra three quarter a pound. Now, I'm not taking that from my records. I'm taking that right out of the research reports. 13 states, countless trials. You can hang your hat on three quarter pound. $35 a cow. Replacement heifers. And I don't sell them, I keep them. An additional three quarter pound during the 150 days that they're being developed is another $12.75 a cow. Now I don't take that to the bank, but my heifers are bigger cycling more reliably, mm -hmm. conceiving more reliably. So anyhow, let's recap that. 46 bucks on weaning weight, 114 on weaning percentage, backgrounding 35, and 12 on the heifers is $209 per cow per year. So, if it cost me 304 to renovate, I got 208 coming back. I paid for my novel end fight in less than one and a half years. I like to play with math, so I said, what if I was two acres per cow? $400 per cow cost divided by 209, just under two years. What if I was three acres per cow? $600 to renovate divided by 209, almost three ac acres per cow. And at four acres, it comes to almost four, four years. It almost looks like my return rate is going to equal my stocking rate. You can figure it out for yourself and see what your numbers would say. But this is what it's about. And we've all been on a good ride here last year, the year before. Five, six hundred dollars to the bank per cow. But we know that for a while that time is over. <laughs> Pat Reed, Scott Brown, the prognosticators of markets tell us that we're in this soup for another couple, three years anyway. And it could, even, it could be even four. We know it'll come back, but we've got to live through the interim. Who remembers years when we were felt fairly satisfied if we cleared $100 a cow? Yeah. Who recalls years when there was no clearance per cow? Uh-huh. Would $200 per cow per year help change that? I think it would. And I think novel endophyte is a way to do it. Now, I sold the cows last year. Health issues. The temptation of the market, you can sell an old cow for $2,600, kind of hard to hang on to her. But the crowning factor was when Anita came home in February and said, honey, I'm going to retire. We love to travel. Throw in the health of the market, and now that she's not working, we can just jump in the car and go. Cows kind of do hold you down, even if you don't milk them twice a day. And I really think that this is something you need to be looking at to survive. Grassland renewal, I think we gave this alliance a good name. It's about renewal. And every one of you, I think, have got potential to do it. The lab work backs up the product. The science is solid behind it. And I just really encourage you from both my head and my heart to consider it. There's my contact info. I don't mind questions at home. I prefer email. I take phone calls too. If I can help 
you figure this out for your own farm, I'll be happy to try and do that. Well, his data are better than the researchers' data. <laughs> we use Excel. I don't even know how to use Access. We were hoping you'd pay attention here. Yeah. <laughs> I, paid I paid attention to a lot more than Greg.